So my talk uh, today, um, I, will, I will first give you a little bit of a, the, the, the context for why his work is important, and that will involve uh, talking a little bit about the so-called axiomatic method. Uh, and then I will talk about Turing's actual paper on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidungs problem. That's, of course, the paper that is known uh, as, especially because it's where Turing introduced the concept of a Turing machine. Uh, and the Turing machine, of course, is now one of the bases of um, the mathematical or the theoretical um, approach to uh, computer science and computability. Um, I will try to stay as non-technical as possible. Um, but so, just so that the people who are familiar with the technical stuff aren't, don't get bored, I will try, I will tell you what's actually in that paper because most of you um, probably haven't read it and it's not, of course, as, as, as very often is the case, right? So you have a seminal contribution to a science and then it sort of gets simplified and modified and then the textbook presentation of the results don't look anything like um, the results that were actually published in the first paper. Uh, so I will try to at least give you an idea of what Turing actually proved, which of course uh, is uh, the main result that he proved and that, he's, um, that he became famous for and the reason why he then uh, went to Princeton, was invited to Princeton um, to study with Church, was that he independently of Church would uh, prove the result uh, uh, just a little while before Turing published his paper, uh, was the so-called undecidability, undecidability of the decision problem. And by the time um, we're done with the first part of the talk, you will know what the decision problem is, and then hopefully by the end, you will have an idea of why the decision problem is unsolvable and how to improve that. And I will conclude with some remarks about sort of the aspects of the paper and why they're um, of their lasting importance. Good, so first of all, what's the axiomatic method? Right? So the axiomatic method is, of course, um, for anyone who's studied the history of science or um, the philosophy of science knows, it's got a, a very long history, so it goes back to 300 BC, to Euclid's Elements, uh, was the first to sort of set down a system of axioms. In the case of Euclid, it was an axioms about geometry. Um, but the basic idea is, is, uh, is actually, the, the conceptual idea is relatively simple, right? So you have a, you have a domain of science, right? So some, some kind of domain of truths about a certain kinds of objects. Right, so that can be about, um, uh, about geometry, or it can be about objects and their movements, uh, for instance, planetary movements, uh, or it can be about uh, thermodynamics, or um, various mathematical theories, like the theory of numbers, or topology, or probability theory, and so on. Uh, and in order to systematize and, um, and codify such a system of truths, or a system of knowledge, um, you come up with a uh, a, s a simple system of primitives, so primitive notions um, that the system talks about. So for instance, in geometry, that might just be points, lines, and planes, and certain relations between them. So we'll see some examples of that later. And then you set up, uh, you set down a number of simple, basic truths. And then the idea is that everything that's true about these things, that you can formulate in these kinds of, in these, with these primitives, will be consequences of these very basic truths. These are the basic truths of, call, of course called the axioms. Uh, and then something that, if, if, if there's a theorem of the axioms, right, so if something can be proved from the axioms, um, that's, uh, that's, all of those things are the things that are true about these objects and their relations. So uh, the axiomatic method proceeds by identifying these principles and collecting um, the basic propositions. Uh, and then the I, the axioms, if you do it right, right, then the axioms will capture all the truths that you, that there are to be had about these um, about these concepts and, and objects, uh, and the axioms will codify and describe all the possible logical relations between the various um, the various notions that are involved. And what this does is it eliminates in the when you're proving facts, when you're proving theorems, for instance, in geometry, from these axioms, um, that in uh, it, it eliminates the need to go to intuition to figure out what, whether, the, whether these theorems are true. Right? So the idea is that all that's required is to appeal to those basic principles and then have a chain of uh, simple steps of reasoning that will provide you with a, with a warrant for the truths of, uh, of the theorems um, that you're proving. 
Uh, one of the main people who were involved in the sort of the conceptual development and pushing the deaxiomatic method was David Hilbert. David Hilbert um, was a German mathematician, was born in 1862 and died um, uh, just, be just before the end of the Second World War in 1943. Um, most of his time, most of his career was spent in, uh, in Göttingen and he was by many considered to be the foremost mathematician of his time. Um, so he made contributions to basically every area of, uh, of mathematics. Uh, what we're interested in, or what I'm interested in um, today, is his contribution to geometry, as an example, and to logic and the axiomatic method in general. Um, one of his most well-known works is um, the so-called Weber Festschrift from 1899, Foundations of Geometry, um, where um, Hilbert um, based on um, previous work by other, um, uh, by other geometers, especially Moritz Pasch, uh, gave a, a new axiomatization of geometry um, that not in the, fir in the very first um, uh, version, but in later versions turned out to be sort of the, to live up to that ideal, right? It sort of completely captured everything that you could um, possibly want to, uh, want to say about um, uh, geometry and even the various different kinds of geometry. So just as an example, so you get an idea of what, what an axiomatic theory is, right? So in the, in the case of geometry, in the case of Hilbert's geometry, in any case, uh, you've got two, uh, a number of primitives. Um, those are the concepts of, uh, of being one of three types of objects, namely being a point, being a line, or being a plane. Uh, and then certain relations between those kinds of things. So for instance, um, the notion of being between, that's a relation between three points which lie on a line. Um, or the uh, relation of containment, for instance, a line can contain a point, uh, or a plane can contain a point or a line, for instance, uh, and then the notion of congruence, which I'll skip for the time being. Uh, and here are some examples of axioms. In total, there were 20 axioms in Hilbert's geometry, so for instance, the first one uh, says that whenever you have two distinct points, um, they determine a line, which means that uh, when, the, or the axioms, the axioms, uh, Precisely, my dream, uh, for any two distinct points A and B, there's one and only one line that contains both of these points. Right? Uh, then an axiom about betweenness, for instance, if A is between points B and C, then A is also between C and B. So betweenness is symmetric in the second and the third argument. Uh, and then the famous parallel axiom, um, if a line G and a point A are both contained in a plane, alpha, but A is not contained in G, so A is a point outside of G, um, then there is one and only one line H, which contains A, so one and only one line through A, which is parallel to G, i.e. it does not intersect G, i.e. Uh, it does not have a point in common right, with G. Uh, and as I said, 17 other axioms, right? So that's the basic idea. 